There's a satellite that NASA has that's looking down on Earth at night, and it shows us a really remarkable sight. If you look at the United States, you can easily pick out all of our major cities, all of our major population centers. You can see Washington and New York, Boston, Atlanta, Chicago, Los Angeles, etc. And if we expand that, and we look not just at the United States, but we look at the entire world, we see this incredibly awesome sight. All of the major population centers of the entire world are visible at night. Light is just pouring off of them. So much light, so much electricity, that you can make out the United States, you can see Europe, you can look down and see India, China, Japan. And you can start to ask yourself, how much electricity are we actually consuming? And so if we look at this by country, what we see is something that's really remarkable, is that from 1980 to 2010, first of all, in the United States, the amount of electricity that we're consuming just continues to increase and increase and increase. But China, starting around 2000 or so, is industrializing, and their consumption is taking off. And if you look, you'll also see that India is doing something very similar. It's just starting to take off. And so instead of looking at it by country, you can say, let's just add all this up. And where are we getting this electricity from? Where are our sources of energy? And so now, what I've shown here on this chart is from 1830 to 2010. You can see that not much happens until we get to about the 20th century, when we start to burn more and more coal. And that right around 1950 into 1960, the amount of oil that the entire world starts to consume just takes off. And with that, you can see natural gas starts to become a major player, hydroelectric, and nuclear fission. And the question that is inevitable that you have to ask yourself is how long is this sustainable? How long can we do this? There are thousands of power plants in the United States and thousands more across the entire planet. How much fuel does a power plant need in a single year? Just one power plant in a single year. If that power plant burns coal, then in a single year you're going to bring in 250 trains of coal, and each one of those trains will have 100 cars on it. If your power plant is burning oil in that single year, you're going to bring in 11 super tankers, each with millions of barrels of oil. If your power plant is a nuclear power plant, you're still going to have to bring in one and a half railroad cars full of fission fuel. And you put all that together, and it paints a, a picture of the world that is very troubling, because there's just no possible way that we can sustain this forever. And so the question becomes, in a utopian society, what would our perfect source of energy look like? What characteristics would you like to see in a perfect source of energy? And I asked myself this same question, and I wrote down a list, and it might be similar to the list that you have. But if I'm going to make a perfect source of energy, then the first thing I want is for this energy to be clean. I don't want any pollution, and I want it to be environmentally clean. I don't want to have to rip up the earth to try to get to this source of energy. I wanted it to be very abundant. I needed there to be a lot of it, because you can see that our need, our electrical needs, our energy needs are just increasing. My perfect source of energy is going to be available anywhere and for everyone. I don't want to have to worry about whether the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. I want to be able to have this perfect source of energy anywhere I need it to be. I don't want to have to use up very much land, so it has to be relatively compact. It needs to be affordable. And the last thing is it has to be safe. And if you think about any energy source, the fossil fuels, solar, wind, hydro, none of those satisfy all of those. So is there a perfect source of energy? And we can look to the sun for inspiration. And normally when we think about looking to the sun, we're thinking of solar energy. We're actually thinking of the edge of the sun, all the light that comes off of the sun. But I want to look deeper. I want to look into the core of the sun, to the power plant of the very sun and the stars itself. 
Because inside the sun is this amazing power plant that's been burning for billions of years, and the sun is going to burn for billions of years more. And what's happening in there is that hydrogen is combining, is fusing, and releasing this tremendous amount of energy. And this idea of fusion energy is something that we have not really thought about as something that we could actually make electricity from until now. And so we know that fusion works at a large size. But the question that I'm asking and that I'm suggesting today is can we create a reliable and economical star here on Earth? Can we recreate what happens in the center of the sun and turn it into a usable form of electricity? So the sun does this with hydrogen, and we're going to do the same thing, though we're going to be very clever about it. We want to make sure that the hydrogen that we use, every time we fuse it together, is going to make as much energy as we possibly can. So we're going to use other types of hydrogen, but hydrogen has a single proton, which is what that plus sign represents. And the types that we're using, which are called deuterium and tritium, are other forms, but deuterium occurs naturally in our seas. And what we're going to do is the sun squeezes down on the hydrogen and causes it to combine and fuse together. But we can't squeeze down on it as strong as the sun can, so instead we're going to heat it up. We're going to heat it up not to the 15 million degrees that is the core of the sun, but to 100 million degrees. And when we do that, the hydrogen is no longer a gas anymore. It's no longer a hot gas. It's a plasma. A hot, hot plasma at 100 million degrees. And since the Earth is covered in seawater, we know that this is potentially an unlimited supply of electricity. And if we focus just on Lake Erie, and we were to take just the top inch of Lake Erie and the hydrogen that's in there, what we would find if we burn that in a fusion reactor, that that top inch is equivalent to all the oil that's left on the planet. So if you start thinking about that, you go, if that's Lake Erie, what about all the oceans? And you can see that this is an energy source that can last for millions and millions of years. Not only that, it satisfies my little list of what a perfect energy source might look like. Because it's clean, there's no pollution, there's no greenhouse gas emissions that might contribute to climate change. It'll be available to all nations for millions of years. It takes up a very modest amount of land. It doesn't care about whether the wind is blowing or the sun is shining. It's affordable. All of our projections of this is that when fusion is ready to be a source of electricity, that it's going to be very competitive to with the fossil fuels and solar and the renewables. And it's safe. There's less than a minute of fuel in the core. This cannot melt down. It cannot explode. It doesn't release large amounts of radiation. If anything were to possibly go wrong in this, it would just cool down. It would go from a plasma back to a gas. And so what we're left with is, can we do this practically, and how can we hold on to this star? If we're going to make a star how, uh, here on Earth, how do we hold on to it? And so what we do is we say to ourselves, we want to hold on to it, and we know it's very powerful, so we're going to bring in our fusion fuel, and it's going to fit in the back of a pickup truck. And it's just going to be gas cylinders, gas cylinders of hydrogen. To hold on to it, we're going to again look to the sun and to the edge of the sun. And what you see if you look at the edge of the sun is this amazing thing. As plasma streams off the edge of the sun, what you'll see is it doesn't just go shooting out to space all the time. It actually curves back around. And what it's doing is it's following the invisible magnetic fields of the sun and just streaming back around. And that's our clue. Because if we can create a magnetic bottle to do a similar sort of thing of what you see right here, then we can hold on to our star and heat it up and have our star right here on Earth. And so that's what we're going to do. And so a fusion reactor, a cartoon of it looks something like this. And the silver represents the vessel that we're going to put the hydrogen gas in. We bend that into a circle, and I've taken a slice out of it so you can see inside. But that's bent into a circle. And outside of that vessel are these incredibly powerful magnets that are going to do just like what you saw on the edge of the sun, are going to cause the plasma to go around 
the inside of that vessel. And if we can do that, and if we can add energy to heat this up, then we will produce so much energy that we can go ahead and get this to ignite. And then we've created a star right here on Earth. And so this idea, this quest for fusion, has been going on since the 50s. And in the United States, it started right down the road at Princeton with a man named Lyman Spitzer. And he's standing in front of what he called the Model A, the Stellarator, which means a star generator. And it sat on a tabletop and was held together with a wood frame. And Professor Spitzer was an amazing person because he also suggested not just how we might create a star, but that we should put a telescope up into above the atmosphere, and that's what became Hubble. So that's the 50s, but if we move to the 80s, this is another machine that was at Princeton. And this machine here is much larger, and you can just sort of make out over here, there are actually people standing on top of this machine. You can't even see anymore the vessel that's bent into a circle, but everything you see here is either part of the magnets to hold on to it, the heating system to heat it up, or some of the equipment that we use to understand, are we making the type of fusion reactions we want to make? Are we holding on to it in the right way? And if you look inside this, now you can see inside it, and here's someone kneeling inside the chamber. And you can see that this is what we've got. Our magnets are going to cause our hot plasma to go right around, and then it's going to collide, and it's going to fuse. We can even look while the reactions are going on. And this right here is a plasma at 100 million degrees being held onto by the magnetic fields. We can go from the 1980s to today. And this is the largest, most powerful machine currently in the world. It's in England. It was built by the Europeans, called the Joint European Taurus. And now you can see that there's a person standing inside this vessel and he has no chance of reaching the top. The machine has become incredibly large. But more than just becoming large, what's happened is that if we look at how much fusion energy we're making with all of these machines, not just the ones I'm showing you, but the, all the other machines that are being built and have experiments running all over the world, what you see is that the amount of fusion energy over time has increased by 100 billion times. And I've compared that to how fast our computers are going. And you can see that fusion is proceeding at a pace even faster than how, how fast all of our computer chip manufacturing is going. But that's not good enough. We've got to take a big jump and not just have our next point there, it has to actually be off of the scale. We've got to now make enough fusion energy that we can go ahead and make a real power plant. And so to do that, we have two things that we have to do. And the two things that we have to do is first, we have to optimize our magnetic bottle. And the entire world is working on this together. And so what you see here are photographs of machines that are in the United States, they're in Europe, they're in Japan, they're in China, they're in Korea, they're in India. But the entire world has grouped together to come up with what should we use to hold on to this star. And at the same time, all of these countries have said, we need to go ahead and make our first star. And so our first star that we're going to make is happening in the south of France. And this photograph was taken last month. And what's going to happen over the next seven years is all the construction is going to be completed. And inside that orange building right here is going to be a machine that looks like this. And this machine is going to ignite. It's going to be the first machine that produces more energy that it consumes. It's the first star. And we call this machine eater, which is a Latin word for the way, because this is the path and is the way forward. And just to give you an idea, right over here is a person about my height, right in this corner. This is an incredibly complicated, large device that the entire world has come together to build. But this machine right here, when it comes online around 2020, will soon produce enough energy to power a city of 500,000 people. And when we've got that machine running, we're going to be able to understand all the details it takes 
when we have an ignited star and we're holding on to it with a plasma. Sorry, holding on to it with a magnetic field, our plasma. Then we have one more step to do. We've got to go ahead and take all this information and we've got to combine it. We've got to go ahead and make a pilot power plant. What that means is that we're going to now take all that energy, we're going to make electricity, we'll put that onto the electrical grid, we'll figure out how to do it reliably, and we're going to figure out how to do it economically. Because like with any new technology, the first time, <clears throat> the first time you do it, it's relatively expensive, and then the cost of doing that drops off until the cost of fusion is competitive with the cost of all of our other energy sources. And so what's about to happen when that, when that occurs? the world changes, right? We have a perfect source of energy. And what we've got is we started in the 50s with a small tabletop machine. Today we have a machine in Europe. Tomorrow we've got ITER, which is the way forward. Soon after that we have our first demonstration pilot plant. And sometime around 2045, fusion energy streams onto the electrical grid. We can make it locally. The source of it is hydrogen that we get out of water. We don't have to care about whether the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. It's safe. It can't melt down. It can't explode. And it's going to last forever. The world as we know it will change. And so what I'll leave you with is one last thought about utopia, which is that a perfect energy source is not a dream. And we are a very short time away from it becoming a reality. Thank you.